Aftershocks are continuing, as you've mentioned, to rattle the Ridgecrest area. It began with the magnitude 6.44 shock, as we all know, on the 4th of July, then the main earthquake, 7.1 magnitude Friday night. We've been talking about all of the quakes this morning, and we're joined now by Dr. William Crow. He's a uh, geologist at CSUB, and, you know, the Ridgecrest police chief said this is, you know, by the grace of God, this is a miracle that we sustained this earthquake and very little damage. Why didn't we see more damage with the 7.1? Uh, normally we would, but it's it's mostly because of just the lower population, the lower density around uh, in Ridgecrest. For the people in Ridgecrest, it was intense and, and, and pretty terrifying, but the lower population means lower, lower damage to structures and to people as well. Does it have anything to do with the fault? Because we know that is a, a different fault than, let's say, the 1952 earthquake that really affected Bakersfield, which was the White Wolf fault. Is Does the fault have anything to do with it in terms of why they didn't see as much damage as if we saw an earthquake on the uh, on the Wolf Fault? It can, it can, what would make more of a difference is whether, what the depth it's at, and yeah. I think this was at eight kilometers depth or something like that, and so that can make a, a bit of a difference. Now we're showing a map that I created here to give a general vicinity of the fault. So we've got the Garlock Fault, which was the uh, uh, the earthquake up near the Ridgecrest area. It was close to it, yeah. Close to it. Uh, and then the White Wolf Fault, that was the fault that basically came alive in 1952, and then you can see the San Andreas. A lot of people have been wondering, you know, with the earthquakes out of Ridgecrest, could that trigger the White Wolf, uh, White Wolf Fault or the San Andreas? From this specific earthquake, not likely. Um, we are worried about that type of thing with called earthquake triggering, um, but generally that's a risk that we have immediately following a large earthquake, and that risk decreases significantly over the next couple of days. So we're probably at low risk for a larger magnitude event being triggered by this earthquake. That's good news right there. And for those of you who don't know, the 1952 earthquake devastated Tehachapi, Arvin, Bakersfield area, basically changed the landscape of our community. It was a 7.7, 7, I believe, 7 magnitude. 7.3 earthquake. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and that was due to that White Wolf uh, fault line that Kevin was talking about. Okay, so correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, this fault was kind of relatively unknown that caused this earthquake. And so should we be worried that it caused such a big magnitude earthquake with a fault we maybe didn't know about? Um, not at all. Um, one of the reasons that we know about different earthquake or different fault zones is that we, they have earthquakes that occur on them. So an earthquake needs to have occurred in the past. It could have been in the geologic past, the recent, recent geologic past, that we know, okay, it's a relatively active fault. Um, we may not have evidence of that, and that's about the only way we know that a fault is active and, and dangerous for earthquakes. So before we go to break, you're telling us that we're looking good for no more earthquakes at this point. We're always having earthquakes, so you always <laughs> want to be prepared for earthquakes. Uh, especially where we live, large faults, we want to be prepared for earthquakes. Well, thank Perfect. you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. We're going to take a quick break and be right back.